we won't be doing any live polling today, so, at least in this session, so no worry about that. Uh, and just so everyone is aware, questions from both the in-person and the virtual participants will flow into the same queue. So the questions receiving, uh, received represent the total session audience. So there's no, there's no specific uh, pri priority to the questioning. Speaking of that, that queue uh, is uh, led up by uh, Sarah Obadina. She's the session coordinator for today. Sarah is the former resident inspector at Calvert Cliffs. Uh, and she works with me now in the uh, NRC's Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, Division Reactor Oversight Inspection Branch. My name is Zach Holcraft. I am your chair. I'm the uh, Resident Inspector Program Lead. Uh, and uh, I've been in this role since 2020. Uh, Prior to that, I was the last senior resident inspector at Three Mile Island Unit 1. Prior to that, I was the resident inspector at Callaway Plant out in uh, Region 4. Prior to that, I was a resident inspector development program project engineer in the Region 4 office in Arlington, Texas. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to the Honorable David A. Wright. Commissioner Wright was first sworn in as a commissioner on May 30th of 2018. He is currently serving a term ending in June 30 of 2025. Commissioner Wright was owner and president of Wright Directions, LLC, a strategic consulting policy development and communications business focusing on energy and water. During this time, he was also a member of the Advisory Council on the Bipartisan Policy Center's Nuclear Waste Initiative and an ex officio member and chairman emeritus of the Nuclear Waste Strategy Coalition, an ad hoc organization representing the interests of industry, state officials, local governments and tribes, and consumer advocates. From 2004 to 2013, Commissioner Wright served the South Carolina Public Service Commission in a variety of capacities, including vice chairman and chairman. From 2011 to 2012, he served as president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. He had previously served at the association in other capacities, including as a member of the Executive Committee and Board of Directors. From 2010 to 2013, Commissioner Wright was a member of the Advisory Board of the Board of Directors of the Electric Power Research Institute. Previously, he was elected councilman and mayor in Irma, South Carolina, and to the South Carolina House of Representatives. For those of us who have had a pleasure to know Commissioner Wright, know that he is a colon cancer survivor. He is an advocate for cancer awareness and education and a former member of the Leadership Council of the, uh, for the Cancer Centers of the University of South Carolina. He was presented with the Community Champions Award by Molina Healthcare of South Carolina in 2016 and the Blue Star Service Excellence Award by the USC Center for Colon Cancer Research in 2014. In 1996, he received South Carolina's highest citizen honor, the Order of the Palmetto. Commissioner Wright received a bachelor's degree in political science from Clemson University. Ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner Wright. Thank you so much. Good morning, or good afternoon now, right? Good afternoon. So thanks, Zach. Um, it's an honor to be with you here this afternoon in this special breakout session on the first day of the RIC, celebrating the 50th year anniversary of the Resident Inspector Program. And I'm pumped to be able to kick this special session off. Um, 50 years, wow, that's, that's a long time. Um, in the time that I have today, I'd like to take you back to the first class of on-site resident inspectors. These are the folks that began work after the conclusion of the Atomic Energy Commission's 1974 pilot program, which you'll hear more about later in the panel. So let me set the scene. The year is 1978, and the NRC is still in its infancy. Some other things that were going on in the world around that time, Jimmy Carter was president and Walter Mondale was vice president. The comic strip Garfield made its debut. The Bee Gees had several hit songs, <laughs> including Night Fever and Stayin' Alive. Argentina won the World Cup, defeating the Netherlands three to one. Diane Keaton won an Oscar for Best Actri uh, Actress in her role in Annie Hall. The average cost of a new house in the United States, and this is painful, $55,000. For you baseball fans out there like me, 1978 was the year that the Yankees overcame a 14-game deficit against the Red Sox and went on to win the World Series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. And Bucky Dent was the World Series MVP, if you remember. The world was clearly a different place, and so was the nuclear industry in the United States. The safety and performance of the fleet were not what they are today. Today, we're uh, used to seeing capacity factors of around 95 percent or so. Back then, it was probably more like 55 percent. Uh, plant trips and forced maintenance outages were common. 
um, and we're undermining public confidence and trust. IMPO hadn't even been created yet, and licensees were struggling to improve everything from operations to chemistry. As a nation, we had a lot to learn about nuclear reactors. With that backdrop, I want to tell you a story about one of the NRC's first resident inspectors. He started in the NRC's first cohort of residents in 1978. He was 27 years old, and he had degrees in electrical and nuclear engineering, some things that the NRC never changed. We have multi-degreed people all over the place. Like other members of the first resident cohort, he had been recruited because he had experience, having worked at Argonne National Lab southwest of Chicago. At that time, the goal for resident inspectors was to have the same plant knowledge as a licensed senior reactor operator, or SRO. The training was intense and difficult. There was no NRC technical training center, so the candidates split their time between classroom training at the NRC's East West Towers in Maryland, which you can see in the photo. Uh, is it up there? So who's running the photos? Unfortunately, we didn't get the updated slides in. Well, it. that's too bad. <laughs> it was they were really good photos. <laughs> <laughs> and the simulators um, uh, at Sequoia, which were owned and operated by TVA, because TVA also had to train and qualify their own operators, it was difficult to get simulator time. And the NRC could only rent the midnight shift. It wasn't easy, and it required long hours and personal sacrifice. Half of the class washed out, but our inspector persevered. He completed the training and was assigned to the davis Bessie Nuclear Power Station in Ohio. When he arrived on site, he was truly on an island. There were no senior residents at that time and no site admins either. He was it. At that time, there were also no regulations requiring licensees to provide the NRC with office space. So he was assigned to a small, poorly insulated trailer. In the winter, cold wind and snow would blow in through the gaps in the window frame and under the door. That didn't bother him, though. He was focused on the NRC's mission of protecting the public's health and safety. Back then, there was no relocation assistance program either. One member of the first cohort got stuck paying two mortgages for a lengthy period of time. He tried to downplay the situation, but unbeknownst to him, his wife wrote a letter to the chairman informing him about the problem. Ruh -roh. <laughs> <laughs> this started the wheels turning and eventually led to some of the relocation programs that we have in place today. This was especially important back then because residents' tours of duty were only three years, not the seven years that we have in place today. Our inspector loved the work and felt a deep sense of purpose and mission, but life wasn't easy. Of course, there were no computers, no internet, so he had to handwrite his inspection reports and physically lick them and mail them to the Region 3 office where they were typed up on NRC letterhead. Then they were mailed again, this time to NRC headquarters where they were kept in our document room so that interested members of the public could read them. The Region also sent copies to the local library in the small town near the site where local citizens could read them as well. Eventually, our resident received a high-tech device known as a fax machine, which could send papers at the blazing speed of six minutes per page. Site coverage was also not easy. With no senior resident to work with, he had to coordinate site coverage with the regional office. He had a beeper provided by the licensee that they would use to notify him about a plant trip or some other event. He worked back shift hours, but there was no first 40 schedule at the time, so many of these hours were unpaid. He was not deterred, though, because he loved the mission. After completing his tour, he returned to the region where he was promoted to section chief. He continued to work his way up the ranks and ultimately ended up serving over 30 years at the NRC. Anybody want to guess who I'm talking about? It's Luis Reyes. Where are you at? Is he in here? Where is he at? Luis in here? So... Um, I told you this story because I wanted to talk about selfless service, and I believe Luis embodies that. Like Luis, our residents are on the front line. 
They are our eyes and ears, our boots on the ground. And it can't be overstated just how important that is. Our residents make sacrifices that deserve to be recognized too. Whether it's moving kids to a new school or asking a spouse to change jobs, it isn't easy. And I, for one, want you to know that I appreciate what you do. As you can tell by this story, the resident inspector program has come a long way, but we aren't done yet. I know that we've taken some important steps uh, lately to improve the quality of life for residents, and I'm hopeful that we can do more. So let me close by saying thank you to any of you who have been a resident or are a resident today. Um, I see you, and I appreciate all that you do. Thank you very much. I'll make the best of the situation. Unfortunately, yeah, his slides could get in, but I do want to point out this picture. I could have chosen just the headshot for Commissioner Wright, but I love this photo of Commissioner Wright out in the field with uh, Mac Reed out of VC Summer. Commissioner Wright likes to do his day in the life uh, tours where he comes out and he visits with the residents. He's by himself. I actually talked to Mac after Commissioner did this uh, tour with him. He said, Commissioner, he, you know, Commissioner called him the night before and said, well, what do I need to do? And Mac told him, I get there at 6 a.m. And Commissioner said, okay. <laughs> and he came out and he shadowed Mac all day. They did inspections, they walked around, they talked to people, and he really did live, live his life you know, as a resident for that day. So everyone up here on this podium today has resident inspector experience. Uh, Commissioner Wright, I would say, honorarily has, has, has at least a day's worth of resident inspector experience. And I know he's done a couple of them, so at least four days. Three days worth. Three days. <laughs> All right, so we'll go back to the beginning. Obviously, uh, from the title of this, of this uh, panel, it's the 50th anniversary of the Resident Inspector Program. Why did we choose this year as the 50th anniversary? In 1974, the Atomic Energy Commission, not the NRC, the Atomic Energy Commission, so the Resident Inspector Program actually predates the NRC by one year. Uh, the, uh, the AEC's Director of Regulatory Operations initiated a trial program of res resident inspection. Two inspectors were located in the proximity of four plants. The first of these, Mr. Dwayne C. Boyd, was assigned as the resident inspector at the Kewanee and Point Beach sites in June of that year. Mr. Boyd assumed this role, and in September 1974, an additional resident inspector was assigned to the Palisades and D.C. Cook facilities. This trial program was terminated in October 1976, and of this, us being the NRC, an evaluation of this trial period was performed and yielded the following benefits. On-site inspection time increased, inspector knowledge of the plant increased, and NRC awareness of plant status and problems improved. I think that's a pretty, those are some pretty obvious conclusions, as, uh, you know, some easy benefits uh, for having folks on site. The following year in 1977, President Carter asked the NRC to implement a program that would place resident inspectors at power reactors and other nuclear sites. The staff provided five proposals to the commission for consideration. I'd like to run through those proposals real quick just to give you an idea of the realms of possibility that we had in 1977. Uh, there were, so five options, uh, and they recommended option three. So option one was basically status quo, which was no resident inspectors. We would continue with team inspections from the regional offices. Option two was similar to what the pilot program was, where we would have semi-residents at satellite offices that would cover multiple sites. Option three is very similar to what we have today. It was the recommendation, and that's devoted, you know, full-time resident inspectors on site at each uh, reactor facility. Option four, this is where it gets really, you could see the realms of possibility in 1977. Option four was 24-7 coverage on site at every uh, uh, reactor facility under construction and operating. And option five, and this was, uh, this was actually a proposal from a citizens group, uh, was 24-7 inspector coverage in the control room, and the most extreme of that version was that that individual would have authority to shut down the plant due to safety concerns. Uh, just, I, I think it's fascinating to think about, as the commissioner alluded to in his talk, you know, it was a different time in the 1970s. In this paper, the benefits that were provided to the commission for this decision making was increased NRC knowledge of conditions at a licensee facility and better technical basis for regulatory action, lessened reliance on the accuracy and completeness of licensee records by improving the inspector's ability to independently verify licensee performance. That one, it's a lot of words to basically describe being able to observe licensees in the field, observe the operators, the technicians in the field performing their evolutions 
was seen as much better than re reviewing paperwork after the fact. Additional assurance that licensee management control systems are effective and that licensee performance is acceptable. And lastly, improved NRC posture is, uh, relative to incident response. Our first panelist today is Scott Morris. He serves as the Deputy Executive Director for Reactors and Preparedness Programs, the DEETER, in the Office of the Executive Director for Operations, where he leads the NRC offices of NRR, Nuclear Reactor Regulation, Nuclear Security and Incident Response, ENSER, and the NRC's four regional offices. Mr. Morris previously served as the Regional Administrator in Region 4 and Director of the Division of Inspection and Regional Support, my former boss, uh, in the Office of the Nuclear of, uh, NRR. He's also held several senior management positions in ENSER and most importantly, was a resident and senior resident inspector. Scott, I've done a lot of research obviously in my position as a resident inspector program lead and it's led to this panel today. Uh, and one of the reasons I've done that is I really want to try and nail down what our original thought and intent was is regarding the purpose of the Resident Inspector Program. These four benefits that I put up here uh, are the best that I could find uh, in those original documents. So my question to you to kick this off is, uh, what do you believe are the primary purposes of the Resident Inspector Program? And I guess maybe a better question is, what's the importance of the Resident Inspector Program to you as the DEETER? Yeah, thanks, Zach. Appreciate the introduction and the questions. Um, well, I, first of all, I would say that my, my answer would align pretty closely with the, these original proposals. I mean, and, and Commissioner Wright mentioned eyes and ears, boots on the ground. Um, whether you like those terms or not, it's, it's, a, it's a presence a, in the field, you know, for a significant fraction of time that 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 in and of itself ha has a lot of benefits and w one, I think one of the purposes is uh, um, is having that sort of global no uh, knowledge of all the things that are going on, sort of keeping a big picture of, of all the different things that are going on in a, a site and maybe something we don't talk a lot about but um, you know, in addition to following up on trips and transients and events and watching maintenance and watching evolutions in the control room, um, looking at how radiation protection gets done, how security gets done, you know, any and all of those things on any given day. Um, it's, it's really the, the thing we don't probably talk about a lot, but I think is hugely important. And for me, one of the key purposes is those the individuals that serve as resident inspectors are um, have the opportunity to listen to conversations, listen, look at how decisions are getting made um, at the licensee facilities, under, and really get a sense of the safety culture. We don't have a you know a direct baseline inspection really on safety culture, and that's fine. Um, but in addition to all the things I mentioned, I think that in and of itself is a really important aspect of the job because it, it gives me a sense as Dieter, for one thing, I can, for one thing I can say when people ask me or challenge me, well, why is this plant safe? Well, my first answer almost always is because I have, we have people, um, highly trained and skilled people who work at that facility every day. They live in the community. They send their kids to the schools in the community. They own property in the community, et cetera. And, that, and, and they wouldn't do that if they didn't think it was safe. They wouldn't put their own family in harm's way if they didn't think it was safe. So for me, it, it all boils down to credibility as an independent, objective, credible regulator. Having that presence in the field um, on a very regular basis who understands the complexities and nuances of a particular site or plant, has access to senior leadership at the plant, to, through middle management down to first line supervision to uh, individuals working in the field, in the control room. That type of access and that type of opportunity to engage the licensee staff in that way, in addition to looking at the full breadth of technical work that they do, um, for me, is gives us the credibility we need to be an independent objective regulator. And I, so I, I th and we leverage the fact that we have resident inspectors at these sites all the time, whether it's in media interactions, public interactions, interactions with our congressional oversight committees, you name it. So, thanks, Scott. You actually, uh, when you were talking about safety culture, it jogged a memory. I had a conversation with a former resident inspector today. We talked about the fact that you know the, the most. 
readily apparent uh, judgment that we have inspectors on site is we have our quarterly integrated inspection <laughs> reports and we document our findings in there. Yeah. And uh, what he was alluding to is the fact that those, you know, findings aren't the only way that a, a resident inspector can, can monitor, you know, provide oversight of right. the site and ensure that the site is acting safely and that safety. So, yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up because I, I should have said this as well, is I think um, th the mere fact that there is an office on site with the light on inside and the door open that says Nuclear Regulatory Commission on it and knowing that there's somebody in the NRC parked in the NRC parking spot in the in out in the outside the fence, and that there's someone or some buddies with wearing white hats with the letters NRC walking around the plant. I think, I think it's impactful just in and of itself on on what happens at a site. On it's kind of like we've all we all probably drive and. Um, if, if, I, if I had a police officer in my back seat all the time, I might change a little bit about how I, how firmly I come to the stop sign, and so it, it's impactful. It, it, you, Just the mere presence. You stole my thunder, Scott. That's going to be in my slide, a, a couple slides from now. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry. Fantastic. We didn't coordinate. It in, in <laughs> no, 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 no. It's 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 kind of it's a buried point, but it's a very important one. Um, so. Uh, fast forward, the commission approved uh, the staff's recommendation, recommendation three, uh, and that initial approval was for a nationwide pilot. Uh, originally it was supposed to be eight sites. Uh, it was later expanded to 20, um, and it was supposed to be baby steps. We were going to implement, and this was the, this was the initial cohort that Luis Reyes was a part of. It, you know, we were going to implement, test it out, slowly build the program up. But then March 24, 1979 occurred, uh, and uh, the timeline got uh, escalated. Um, the thing that I find so interesting about this time period is the resident inspector program, so yeah, the commission directed the staff to go to full implementation right away, to skip the pilot, go, go, go full. Um, and so we had the staff, I think it was 139 resident inspectors uh, at all the operating and, and uh, uh, sites under construction at the time. Uh, and we had to do it in a year or two. Uh, and it, I just, I cannot imagine. <laughs> I'm running a fully running program <laughs> that's 50 years old. I couldn't imagine starting from scratch, having to write the procedures, the uh, programs, hiring all these people. We didn't have the staff to fill these roles. We had to hire. Um, we had to backfill. We had to come up with policies. We had to, we had to write, yeah, the commissioner alluded to rule. We wrote uh, 10 CFR 5070 inspections um, to require licensees to provide office space if they have a resident inspector on site. We had to do all these things rapidly. We had to do it during a time where this was just one of the things that we were working on as an agency. And I mean, you know, as the commissioner alluded to, by this time we might not have been in our infancy, but we were certainly still a toddler. Uh, so I just, I, I just it, was, it would have been an interesting time to be in the NRC, I think. With that, I'd like to introduce our next panel member. Billy Dixon is a branch chief in the Division of Operating Reactor Safety in Region 3 in Lyle, Illinois. Since joining the NRC in 1996, he has held, most importantly, uh, positions as resident inspector at Dresden, senior resident inspector at Clinton Power Station, and senior resident at Braidwood Nuclear Station. He's also been a branch chief in the Region 3 Division of Reactor Safety and Division of Reactor Projects. He is also a recent graduate of the SES Candidate, Candidate Development Program. Billy, as a former resident and now as a current leader of resident inspectors as a branch chief to residents, what does it take to be a resident inspector? What makes a good one? Thank you for the question, Zach. Uh, so based on my experience as a resident inspector, senior resident inspector, and an, an individual who actually currently supervise resident inspector, I think it's very important that uh, resident inspectors must maintain and develop and maintain an understanding of how basic nuclear power plant and operations provide for the protection of public health and safety. Inherent in that, um, you must have, uh, have the ability to apply concepts from various technical areas. Um, so an understanding of science and engineering fundamentals are essential. Uh, the second um, attribute I believe it takes to be a resident inspector is that you must master the um, art of collecting, analyzing, and um, integrating uh, co uh, information from various resources such as codes and standards um, to, in order to make an informed, um, supportable regulatory uh, decision. 
Uh, this is important for all of our residents, uh, all of our inspector types, uh, but it's especially important because of the resident inspector um, and the number of different um, 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 technical fields and situations that uh, they have to deal with in, in performing their everyday duties. Um, the last attribute that I'll actually talk about and this major attribute I'm going to discuss today, I believe that the resident inspectors have to exhibit good personal and interpersonal skills while conducting their regulatory, act, regulatory activities. Um, they have to do this as individuals and, and have to do this as part of the team. Um, they have to be able to clearly express their thoughts and ideals. They have to um, effective, be effective listeners and they have to speak and um, um, write with the appropriate uh, safety focus and context. Um, within our NRC, it's, it's all, you often heard and you've heard today that the, the res inspectors are the eyes and ears of the agency. I often counsel and remind my res inspectors that they're on site, they're, they are the face of the NRC. Um, the, inter, the res inspectors actually interact with all levels of plant employees, from the maintenance department, all the disciplines in the maintenance department, the engineering um, disciplines, they actually um, have, um, have interactions with the radiation radi radi protection, health physics uh, personnel on site and all levels of management. And it is very important that the resident inspectors be able to um, maintain positive, positive and professional relationships with uh, plant staff. So Zach, th those, are the, those are the attributes that I, um, that I believe um, you have to have to be a resident inspector. Um, you did ask it, it, what, takes, what it takes to be a good res inspector. They have to master all of those, um, master all of those attributes. Uh, but there's another attribute that, um, that, that I've found as a supervisor that, you, that, that, that I think takes, takes a, makes a res inspector a very effective res inspector. Uh, those who can work independently uh, make a great res inspectors. Those who actually um, um, can exemplify um, teamwork, make a great resident inspector, and those who exhibit flexibility and adaptability. As a resident inspector, resident inspectors deal with a lot of different circumstances. Um, they do have to understand what's going on at the plant, one, what goes on, goes on at a plant, but at the same time, they need to be able to adapt because of all types of issues, um, equipment failures and ha uh, having to deal with uh, abnormal operating occurrences. So, Zach, those, that's what I believe actually makes an effective resident inspector, and thank you for the question. Thanks, Billy. You know, you know as a branch chief, uh, I remember back to my days uh, both as a junior officer in the Navy and then later as a resident inspector and senior resident, and uh, probably the hardest thing for me to learn was that it was never wrong to call the branch chief. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember, you know, my qual board, every single question was like, well, what would you do in this situation? And, well, I'd first call my branch chief. <laughs> and then they'd say, well, what if you didn't pick up? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that was a great answer. I, you know, you, you, you touched on a lot of things that I was thinking about. One of the things that I'm often reminded of is, uh, you know, we've, we've had a big focus uh, uh, on becoming a much more modern risk-informed regulator. And, and it's been interesting, you know, I was a resident as we started that process of change and cultural change, and obviously I moved on to uh, my current position now, and I find conversations with residents, they're always struggling to find what that means to them, and one of the things that I, I constantly remind them and others about is that resident inspectors have always been risk informed. You know, it's it, a resident inspector for 50 years now has had to separate the wheat from the chaff very quickly. They look, they see so much information coming in. You know, if you're at a, a, at a two unit site and you're reviewing uh, their corrective action database on a daily basis, there could be a hundred condition reports that you're screening through in that, in that moment, you know, those couple minutes, and you have to pick out those important ones. You have to do that risk informed decision making right there on the spot. Uh, and use that knowledge and that, techni that technical basis and that training that you have to, to figure out, oh, this one's important. This one, this one takes some follow-up. And, you know, this one about the paint being the wrong color in the cafeteria, I can probably <laughs> let someone else handle. Um, and so, I, I, yeah, I think you really nailed it there. I, I did want to bring up, I, I had the pleasure of uh, receiving this very old and yellow document uh, earlier this week on, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's some of the original training that the commissioner had alluded to for the resident inspectors in 1977. So this is a memorandum for the, uh, 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 for inspectors from Ernst Vogelnau, the director of the Office of Inspection Enforcement. I just want to read the first paragraph. It's obviously a very thick document. As an NRC inspector, you are a vital contributor to nuclear safety. 
You and other NRC inspectors form the cutting edge of our regulatory program because you are located in the field where you can personally observe and improve the performance of licensees. In order to properly fulfill your responsibilities, you must have at least three important qualities. Honesty, devotion to duty, and professional knowledge. And then obviously, the rest of the book is about how to, <laughs> how to have those three things. <laughs> uh. So, 1980, the program's getting staffed, uh, and uh, we actually wrote a, uh, a report to Congress. Congress was very interested in this program and, and its a process, especially following Three Mile Island. Um, and so, uh, uh, in that, we had a section where we talked about industry perception on, uh, on the benefits of the program, and perhaps also of some of the issues that industry, some of the other feedback industry had for the implementation of the program. Um, but uh, in their discussion of the actual benefits that the, that the industry uh, uh, offered up, they said uh, better communication, increased focus on requirements in the field. That gets back to this concept of they, they noticed, like Scott was saying, having that inspector over their shoulder or someone who could be in the field at any moment watching them perform work in the field, uh, industry leadership commented that you know, the focus among their technicians and their operators shifted from ensuring that evolutions were properly documented, which had been the previous you know, way that, you know, primary means that we provided oversight, to actually being done appropriately in the field the first time, you know, like, like in the moment, they were more focused on doing the right thing in the moment. And they, that was a widespread uh, uh, piece of feedback. Minimal regulatory burden, I thought this was a very interesting comment. It really had to do with the idea that, you know, when you have a resident inspector on site, they, there's some time they're going to take to familiarize their, themselves with that licensees, programs, and processes, but once they're ingrained into all of that, they, they don't need so much support from the licensee to track down documents or look for things or find their way around the plant. One of the unfortunate drawbacks with team inspections even today is that there is a period of time of preparation where the, those team inspectors have to get caught up and they have to learn the licensees' processes and procedures before they can perform a, uh, an effective inspection. And so taking a lot of that away, the, the, um, the licensees really felt like that was a major plus. Um, ongoing observation of correction of problems. The ability of a resident inspector to see something happen real time and then see how that licensee responds, how they document it in the corrective action program, how they prioritize it, how they uh, 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 determine uh, the cause and they perform and they determine the corrective actions. That resident inspector can follow that whole process and hold the licensee accountable and make sure they're doing the right things. And licensees could see improvement in that process. There was a lot more follow up in the corrective action program. And of course, more informed NRC response. <laughs> Again, this idea of you know, having a subject matter expert that's a part of the licensee that's right there to be able to um, provide that expertise in a moment's notice should something happen. My next panelist is Mr. George Wilson. He's the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Licensing for TerraPower. He has almost four decades of government and private sector experience in the field of nuclear energy. Before joining TerraPower, he was a senior executive at the NRC, where he served in multiple roles in licensing, oversight, and enforcement of nuclear facilities. Before that, more importantly, he was a resident inspector. <laughs> Before working for the NRC, Mr. Wilson served in, a various, uh, in various capacities for the Tennessee Valley Authority at the Watts Bar Nuclear Plant, including operations and maintenance. Mr. Wilson started his nuclear career as a member of the United States Nuclear Navy. George, acknowledging that your company does not currently have any sites with resident inspectors, perhaps he could still provide some, some industry perspective on the value that resident inspectors bring. Uh, you know, thinking about these bullets and, 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 and what they meant back then and what they mean today, uh, do you have any thoughts about whether or not these are still good things? Are there others? Are there ways we could be doing it better? Yeah, uh, thanks, Zach. Um, I did talk to some of my colleagues to get a more robust answer. <laughs> um, you know, the residents are in the um, public. They do public outreach once a year. There's normally a readily assessment meeting where they're available to the public. They distill public confidence. They remind the public they live in the area. They do communications through reports you know, their quarterly reports or inspections. So the big deal is, hey, they live there and it instills public confidence through different ways. Um, it's also um, beneficial for the residents provide a trending exercise. They look at everything that, you know, a licensee does. They can, it's an independent set of eyes looking at processes and procedures and programs and observations. So 
you know, the major objective for both the licensee and the residents is the safe operation of the plant. So they're both after the same thing. So a resident can provide a lot of observations and trending that then the licensee can use and you collect, you do problems at a smaller level before they become a larger level. So that's where the value that they're adding. The more experience that they got, the bigger broad, if they've been to a bunch of different, you know, so you're getting like benchmarking done because most residents or seniors have done inspections at various places. So they actually get their own best practices and during some of the observations, they could say, hey, I've seen this work here, here, and here. Might not work at your plant, but it gives you some things to potentially try to correct what you can do and enhance some of your programs at the plant. So, yeah, we do see that they, they still add value. Thanks, George. That's, that's great. You touched on uh, some of the ideas of the public, and so did Scott. Uh, so I, want, I, I had this question. I, I really wanted to provide a slide on this, but the research to, to prep a slide on this would have been a little was just a little too much, but you know it's commonplace uh, for any time there's an issue at a site and we put out a press release. There's a, there's a, it's almost become a throwaway line, but it's super important. At the very end, we say something along the lines of resident inspectors are on site and valid and verifying independently verifying that the site is safe. How how important do you think that is to to the public and and I guess to us and to the industry? So I, I'll start, I guess I'll start with Scott. I'll put you on the spot. How important is it us, to us to be able to tell the public that? Well, I mean, I think it's essential, but not but. And I think that um, the acceptance of a, a, an operating nuclear facility in any given community is different. It, you know, it, there's a diverse, uh, there's a wide range of how well a plan is accepted in their community versus not. And, and, um, but in every case, it's important to, to remind folks that, that we do have this resource uh, at, the, at these facilities. And in the cases where, and, and, and I would also say that in probably the vast majority of people in the community don't really think about it. They don't, maybe don't even care that much about it. But the ones that do, and the ones that are active and vocal and engaged and really in, interested in the safe operation of the plant, um, I, that's where I think our residents play a hugely important role. Because they, in my experience, my own personal experience as a resident and senior resident, and all the oversight-related jobs I've had in the, in the, subsequently, that is one of the things that they, I have they, they always tell me that they appreciate this to establish a rapport at that level. To, they know that they have this, this person that they trust, they have a rapport with, that's working at that facility that is objective, independent, not quote unquote captured by the licensee's culture, whatever that may be. Um, so that, that to me is, it's huge. So I, I think we, we have to, it is that, it is important enough that Yes, it may be trite. Yes, it may look like boilerplate language in press releases, but it's vital. I 100% I, I agree. I, yeah, I'm reminded, I think, back during uh, you know, the early days of COVID and you know, we, we ordered everyone to come home. The residents still were going in because it was so important that we reassured the public that we still had inspectors on site performing independent verification. Now, they, they, you know, they, they took precautions, they didn't go in as often, but they still did touch the site uh, on a regular basis and make sure that the, the licensees who were still operating their sites were doing it safely. And I, I always think back on that as just a true sign of how important this program still is to us. Uh, so yeah, George, I, my question to you, I guess, is more, you know, there, there's this concept that a strong regulator kind of uh, lifts all boats, if you will. You know, it, it, it helps the industry because it helps to assure the public. It is, do you think that that's still true, that that helps the industry to show that we're, we're out there providing independent verification? Yeah, yes, I do. I think it does help, you know. Um, it also, in those, in those annual assessments and the public outreach, you know, the, you know, when the NRC reminds, hey, look, that they can come to me and talk to me anytime, just like Scott was talking about, they're in the office. You can come and talk to me about any issue. You know, we're there. So it's not, you know, from the NRC side. So from the industry side, it, like I said, that public reassurance is a big deal. They can go talk to the NRC about anything. 
So it's just not one thing. So the public confidence, hey, look, once again, they're all out there for the safe operations. It's independently verified. You know, that's a big deal. Thanks. Thanks, George. Yeah, Scott, uh, you know, the other thing I was reminded of you, that you mentioned, Scott, the, the number of times that I've had someone say, I didn't realize that we had resident inspectors on site. But now that I know that, I feel safer, <laughs> which I guess that's part of the reason why we're here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, is to make it more it, make it more plain to the to the public and everyone that we still have resident inspectors on site. So, I want to touch on uh, something that uh, is you know has always been there. Uh, you know, and it's one of the reasons why my position exists uh, is to try provide focus on the program and to make and make sure that the program stays healthy. From its initial implementation, it's, it's, the resident inspector program has had pretty consistent staffing difficulties. As the commissioner alluded to, there were term limits in the early days, initially three years. Uh, then it became five years pretty early in the 80s, and then later in the 90s, it became seven years. Uh, this limit causes residents to have to relocate their families uh, each time they get a new position. And, and relocation, anyone that's ever moved, no matter the best circumstances, is hard. Um, so difficulties with relocation, compensation, and career paths has always existed since the beginning. Some of these occur in cycles. Obviously, the economy has a big effect. If the housing market's having a rough time, then our residents have a rough time moving. Uh, the job market actually has a kind of an opposite effect because <laughs> we have a pretty uh, stable demand signal for residents. So if the job market's going down, we actually do a little bit better. Um, and uh, the NRC staff itself goes through cycles, I would say, of, of how we value resident inspector experience um, and in regards to things like promotion potential. Other issues are more like they've been building over time. Uh, demographic changes and attitudes towards telework, especially after COVID-19, uh, have altered perspectives on, on, on you know, like the, the desirability of the resident inspector program. Uh, I had someone earlier say it, it wouldn't be a real panel if you didn't have a current resident inspector on, on, on it. And, I, and, and to that I say, my next panelist is Jen England. She is the senior resident inspector at Susquehanna Nuclear Power Plant <laughs> in Berwick, Pennsylvania. Jen rejoined the NRC in December of 2019 and has served as a resident inspector at the James A. Fitzpatrick Nuclear Power Plant, acting senior resident inspector at North Anna and Beaver Valley Stations, and as an acting senior construction inspector at the Vogel Electric Generating Plant Units 3 and 4. Jen served as the Indian Point nuclear generating uh, resident, uh, nuclear generating station resident inspector during her previous time with the NRC. Before returning to the NRC, Jen served as a quality manager in the aerospace, automotive, and medical device industries. She served as the management representative, statistical process control chair, radiation manager, and the safety manager. Jen worked for Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory and its operations program and on the final safety analysis report for the Virginia class submarine. Jen earned a bachelor degree of science from, uh, chemical, in chemical engineering from Rutgers University. Jen, with all that in mind, uh, simple question, what are the biggest challenges that resident inspectors face today? Thanks for that question, Zach. Um, so the day-to-day -day work of being a resident inspector is engaging. It's extremely satisfying. Each day I have the opportunity to learn something new as I verify that the plant is operating properly for the safety of the public and my family. Um, I will talk more about the positive aspects uh, in a later question, but now I will actually answer Zach's question. <laughs> uh, what are the challenges? The major challenge for the resident inspectors today is a lack of staffing due to the quality of life issues of the role. Residents and fuel facility inspectors are the only NRC employees stationed at a licensee facility, which limits our work-life balance options as compared to the other NRC positions. Due to the location of our jobs, we are required to move regularly, and we cannot always set our work schedule. Moving is a challenge. I know, I just moved in December. I have broken things. We're still working on it. <laughs> but moving does put stress on the entire family. Children need to learn new rules when they attend a new school. Partners and spouses may need to involuntarily leave their job or try to develop a career changing locations every few years. Um, and the entire family will experience social isolation until new community ties can be forged. 
um, my home must be purchased for resale in mind since my job ends after a very short period of time and I am subject to housing market trends. This means I'm unable to personalize my home for my family's needs. Our work schedule is also a challenge. My work hours are not terribly healthy and they strain my family. My plant has a 6 a.m. morning meeting coupled with my 40 minute commute from my resellable home sets my wake up time between 4.30 and 4.45 a.m. This early start time has a negative impact on my body and my family as I am often too tired to participate in evening activities. We also perform inspections off hours. As an example, two weeks ago, I had to observe an unannounced fire drill. For whatever reason, unannounced fire drills are always at 3 a.m. Um, <laughs> next week, the just-in-time training for the upcoming outage is being performed at noon for day shift, which is one portion of the training, and 6 p.m. for night shift, which is another portion of the training. This is the most relevant um, training observation that we will have this quarter, so obviously we will be there. But again, this takes time away from our family and we don't get to set the times. And our refueling outage, as always, starts at 9 p.m. on a Sunday night. Um, shutdown is a required observation, so there will be some, some late nights to do that. Um, I do have the flexibility to take time off during the week. Um, however, my husband and nearby daughter work a standard schedule, so when I take time off then, I really don't have anybody to hang out with. Um, these work-life challenges contribute to the, big the biggest challenge, which is a lack of staffing. Each operating reactor is slated to have a senior resident and one or more resident inspectors. Our daily activities keep us busy. As we determine plant status, we walk down the control room panels, we review every item entered into the corrective action program, and we share this information with the regional office. On a weekly basis, we perform tours in all key areas and we complete inspections in a wide variety of areas. Having at least two inspectors allows these responsibilities to be shared so that more in-depth inspections can be completed uninterrupted and some of our off time can also be enjoyed uninterrupted. Over the last few years, the staffing levels have been well below the full level. Um, I am in the region in the northeast of our 11 plants. Four sites for 2023 had extended periods with a single inspector. 2024, we are already starting this year with one of our sites having an extended period with a single inspector. Just to keep it personal, I'll be alone at my site for eight weeks this summer when my resident completes required training and takes one week of vacation. Our regional management team is very supportive and they do try to fill these spots. Um, and they also provide extra support from regional staff for a week or two at a time. But there just appears to be a lack of interest in the resident inspector position by other agency staff. To summarize, the largest challenge facing the residents is a strain from a lack of staffing, which is caused by the unique and challenging nature of this position. This month, the agency has implemented a retention incentive to keep residents in the field and attract more to the position. Hopefully, this will encourage more staff to take these critical roles. Thanks for the question, Zach. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. I, Jen and I joked, discussed beforehand that she probably had the hardest question. She had to balance, I think, what is an incredibly important subject and, and the need, you know, to advocate for the residents and, and the difficulties surrounding the job without coming off as whiny. <laughs> I think she did really good. Hopefully I was successful <laughs> at not sounding like a whiner. It is a hard job. It, it is. It, a, it is, a, is. There's a lot of challenges. And yes. none of these challenges said inspections are hard. Um, the inspection part is really the great part. That's the part that, that keeps you going into the office every day. Thanks, Jen. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely correct. Can, can I go off script for just a second? Oh, please. I rarely do that. <laughs> um, um, so first of all. We're going to talk about the things that we've done. I know. I'm okay. not going there. Okay. I'm not going there. <laughs> oh, I just want to, first of all, I want to acknowledge, right? Yes. I mean, we, everybody sitting at this table has been through it. Yes. Um, um, and even after resident life, I've uh, myself have moved. So I totally get it. I want you and the rest of the resident community to know that the senior leadership team at the NRC up to and including 
our acting EDO, the regional administrators, the office directors, we get it. And we're, we're, we really are focused on um, the staffing piece. Um, we're focused on, and I'm not going to go down your list of stuff, but <laughs> there's, so, there's more that we can and should and will do. So uh, it, it's just that important. And so I personally wanted to just thank you for sharing your personal experience. And I noted that when, in, when Zach was reading your bio, I, I don't know how many different sites you were at. I lost count, but you've clearly moved quite a bit. And uh, that is a huge toll. So thank you personally for me. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, discussing the challenges, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like the NRC hasn't done things to try and meet these challenges. Uh, from the get-go, the NRC implemented a number of benefits available only to the resident inspectors. We've had a special pay scale since the very beginning um, that, that's above the normal uh, GG pay scale that the rest of us uh, are under. Um, this scale has been adjusted over the years. It was adjusted in the 90s to uh, adjust how the cost of living adjustment was done. Uh, and most recently, it was adjusted in 2020 to account for the fact that if you were in a, a lower rest of the U.S. or similar locality, uh, uh, it, it's, the pay is so low that it's prohibitive for you to be able to move there. And so we adjusted it there as well. Um, we also have something called safe pay. Uh, which is, uh, uh, if you've served, uh, uh, it's now cumulative, uh, uh, six years or more as a resident inspector, you keep that special pay scale when you leave the program. Uh, so even if you go to a job where you would have been paid less, you maintain that higher pay, pay rate. Uh, we offer, a lot of people don't realize that the, uh, the residents get a, uh, they get all the discretionary benefits that we can possibly throw at them when it comes to relocation. Um, so a lot of the things that, uh, uh, like uh, if, if most federal employees, when they move, if they get anything, they get the bare bones, and our residents get everything. They get they get paid uh, uh, they get paid money. They get reimbursed for the real estate fees. We have, we have a home buying service. There's there's admittedly some gripes to how that program <laughs> works, uh, and obviously there's some tax implications, and that's a whole another can of worms. But we do a lot to try and give the residents as much as we can to help offset that move. In 1994, we uh, began a, a relocation incentive uh, where if you move to a new location as a resident inspector, you get a, a percentage of your annual salary. Um, we've adjusted that over the years as well, most recently in 2020 as well. Um, and as, uh, as Jen alluded to, uh, in, uh, in just this month, we implemented a new 15% annual retention incentive for resident inspectors. So if you're on site and you're not under a relocation obligation, uh, you'll receive an additional 15% uh, annually um, because the program is that important and keeping it staffed is that important. Um, one of the touted benefits that's not on the screen, and we've touched on it a couple times, um, and it's been discussed, again, over the year, significantly over the years. In fact, there used to be a, 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 an inspection manual chapter that was titled something along the lines of Resident Inspector Career Paths. Um, it's no longer in effect, and I cannot find a copy to save my life. Um, but is this idea that resident inspector experience is, is of particular, particular value within the NRC, and that those individuals selecting resident inspector jobs should have a leg up uh, when they're applying for more senior positions later in their career. Scott, does the NRC value resident inspector experience? Should hiring managers consider that experience when filling vacancies? So I assume you mean for post-resident? Yes, people. following the resident inspector. Okay, because um, we certainly value the resident inspector experience, but I think <laughs> you're talking about as they move uh, further into their career and, yes. and potentially. So, uh, I'll speak for myself, but I, I think um, there's a pretty uh, significant majority of my peers and others in the, in the leadership team who would agree that there is, I personally value the experience um, that a resident inspector, a former senior resident inspector brings to the table. I think the opportunity to see um, how our you know, regulations and license conditions are actually implemented in the field. I think it was Rogerio mentioned it at the plenary this morning. That was a real aha for him. Um, you know, instead of just looking at calculations and validating things, seeing how it was actually applied in the field was a huge. And I think that 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 not only um, so that expands your aperture as an individual professionally, 
but it also gives you additional insights that you may not have otherwise had, which can be leveraged in your future in future roles. Residents, you know, they they some it's been mentioned a couple times. There's quarterly inspection reports that issued. Well, along with that are also uh, exit meetings, um, where at the end of every quarter, um, the resident and senior resident. Um, or sometimes solo, will sit down with the licensee management team and actually debrief you know, their findings and assessment over the last quarter in what's ultimately going to wind up in the, in the public record. And so that, that opportunity to be able to convey uh, assessment information to that audience um, is, is really important, and, and I think the you get an opportunity every quarter to hone your communication skills and the brevity with which you you can deliver sometimes information that people don't want to hear, right? So, um, but to do it in a very professional, calm, um, um, dispassionate way is is is, is a huge uh, skill set that it, that I think uh, pays dividends in 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 your career long term. Certainly has for me. Um, being able, I, the other thing about it is discernment. We haven't said, I, I think we've talked about, it's, somebody said wheat and chaff, and I think it was you, Zach. And, but the ability to, 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 you know, look at a large data set and, you know, discern what's important and what's not, and what to go after and what can be left for later or not pursued at all. I think that, that skill is also pays dividends in the long run. In, in a, it certainly pays it. Uh, for me in, in my career, um, the opportunities to engage with the public, you know, there aren't, I, mean, I, I would argue that the, the resident inspector position and maybe uh, licensed project managers and some others, you know, probably have the greatest opportunities to interact with the public. Um, that, in, that skill in and of itself, and able to, in order to, again, talk about credibility and, and provide that sense of reassurance that it's safe and here's why. And so it's the communication skills, the listening skills, the, the discernment and assessment skills, those are all things that I think um, are really beneficial in any career. And I think the residents, as a resident inspector, you get lots of opportunities earlier in your, early in your career to do just that. And as I, when I was a um, regional administrator out in Region 4, I observed um, that every, there's four regions, most of you know that in the United States, all four regional administrators were former residents or senior resident inspectors. And, and I think we're at three of four now, but the, the point is, is that that experience serves you well and we, our last, senior executive class that we that just graduated in January I think had five or six former six six senior residents in it so I think that's very very telling about the value of the experience thanks Scott uh, Jen <laughs> <laughs> could you provide some perspective maybe that the current residents have on this um, not not to rebut Scott or not to rebut Scott <laughs> But, Go ahead. <laughs> so senior resident inspectors and resident inspectors have significant autonomy compared to NRC jobs at the same level. We plan and complete our inspections with little supervision as we're the only NRC staff on site. We take initiative to reach out internally to our experts to ensure we properly assess issues and get any technical assistance we need. We communicate our inspection results internally and to the station up to the most senior level on site. We often sit at a table full of licensee staff and respond to detailed challenges for each one of our assessments. This challenging environment provides the opportunity for us to develop good organization, technical and communication skills. This unique set of skills was highly valued by the agency for many years. If I look back on my early days with the NRC 25 years ago, the sentiment was that the path to a promotion was paved by your time as a resident or senior resident. While I am well supported by my branch chief, I am concerned that the representation of the residents in senior leadership roles is quite low, with it being approximately equivalent to the percent of NRC staff with resident experience. These are the executives who make decisions related to our assignments and the program, yet many have never done this job. 
They have never moved their family because they came to an end of a tour or had to avoid parents on a baseball field because they worked for the licensee. I do not share this to, de to discredit these competent and dedicated executives. I share it to highlight that the worth of the experience has declined. This decline is the result of two executive classes in a row not containing a single person with resident experience. Most re recently, as Scott said, there has been more interest in the resident um, position and the most recent NRC executive class contained managers with this experience. The commission has also taken a strong interest in the program, including one commissioner who has spent a day in the life of a resident in several regions to better appreciate the hard work that we do. Hopefully this recent increase in interest in the resident inspector program will encourage more staff to take these critical roles. Thanks, Ash. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Yeah, we've, you know, we've had, I, I've, I've tried very hard to pull data uh, on, on, you know, the, the percentages of resident inspectors. It's always, it's, it's just very hard because, uh, uh, you, know, it, you know, you know, God bless our poor folks over in Ochico, our HR folks, they, they try to, you know, classify everyone correctly, but it's, it's you know, the, the percentages change, the, the, the numbers change, and so it's very hard to pull that data with any real confidence of what I'm getting. I think what I, what I counsel residents in my own humble experience is that both of my promotions from GG 13 to 14 and then uh, 14 to 15, I was told by my supervisor that my resident inspector experience was a key attribute that contributed to my qualifications that helped me get into the positions I was in. Um, and so I know <laughs> that it happens. Uh, yeah, it, what I tell them is it's not, you know, just being a resident inspector isn't enough. You have to, uh, you know, you, you have to also demonstrate your ability to uh, uh, take those attributes and those things that you learned as a resident inspector and apply them at, across the NRC. Do things like lots of rotations and construction inspector positions. <laughs> you know, really, sh and, and pr provide uh, recruitment videos on the resident inspector program. All, you know, these are the kinds of things that show uh, you know, your devotion in, to the NRC and your, and your ability to be a leader on top of just being a resident. And a resident inspector recruitment event. That, that, yeah. Sorry, you I forgot, forgot that about one. that one. <laughs> that, any one of the other probably was enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Zach, your, I, I hate to break your script, but yes, no, I, no, I do no. want to give my perspective because it may be a little bit different than Jan, sure. um, simply because of the fact that, you know, it, to me it depends on where your value systems are. So um, as a resident inspector and a person, former resident inspector, I've, the, the amount of times I've been called to, um, to, to just to be asked about my perspective on issues based on my experience, I value that highly, right? I value the, 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 the respect that's uh, afforded to me as be, being part of a um, resident inspector program. There are other pay incentive issues. But again, I think the agency has done a uh, admirable job in looking at, um, you know, there, that's a very sensitive subject. You know, there's a lot of laws associated with uh, how we're, how, how the agency must, comp uh, uh, must comp compensate its employees. So, you know, I, I believe just personally based on, based on my interactions with senior managers, interactions with uh, a fellow, um, my peers, and interactions with the uh, senior, senior resident corps itself, I believe that uh, the position of, and, and my, my experience has been is very uh, is valued. So, so that's it. Thanks, Billy. Uh, excuse me. I want to look to the future now. Uh, it is, after all, uh, adapting to a changing landscape, or, uh, you know, is our theme this year for the Regulatory Information Conference. So I want to talk a little bit about where we think the program is headed. And, uh, you know, I have two pictures up there. Uh, oh, actually, I have two pictures of, uh, 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 but anyways, um, I have some pictures of some advanced reactors, but I also want to talk about it from a perspective of personnel uh, and, and just the program in general. Um, as we hire a lot of new people and a lot of new folks are coming in, uh, you know, and, and we talked about some of those demographic changes. Um, I want to put it to you, Scott, first. What do you anticipate, what do you see in the future for the resident inspector program? Is there anything you'd like to highlight? Uh, well, I mean, for the operating fleet, I don't, you, you know, we're, in addition to all the things we're doing to try to re attract, uh, recruit 
retain residents. Um, you know that I think that that's not going to change. But in terms of the future, uh, some of the new advanced reactor designs, and I'd be interested in George's thoughts on this. Um, you know, with which are you know Gen four designs with a lot more passive safety system, inherently more inherently safer, much smaller footprint, smaller staff, um, not you know not maybe not as many things going on at any one time. Um, I think there's an opportunity to have a conversation around it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to foreclose on what the future is going to be for the re for residents at, at some of these new designs. I think the answer is it depends. It may depend on how many modules there are. It may depend on the specific design, if it's first of a kind or not. So, but I'd be interested in George's thoughts. But clearly, we're going to have to have a, a, a conversation and, and balance the passive safety features with this need to again have that you know independent objective on-site presence for you know whatever fraction of time is needed to provide that public confidence. But George, I if you don't mind, give it to George. Yeah, I I think the residents will still do the public confidence. That's going to be a big deal when you put a new type of reactor that's never been in the United States before. You've got our reactor up there, which is a sodium fast reactor, and they've only been on the prototypes. Um, so I think they, they do add um, a value. I think, you know, going along with that, you're going to have to look at the number. You're going to have to potentially look at the oversight structure of the oversight program as a whole. Um, did you, you know, how many, you're going to have to look at the numbers that you have based on what you have because there's, you know, my, my plant won't have any safety-related operator actions, you know, so it changes drill scenarios, it changes EP, potentially changes security. So I, I think, you know, the big thing is I think the residents are still going to add value. They need to be there for public confidence. Um, and then you're, you know, or do you, will you always have one there or can you have one that lives between, if you build modules and they're like in a triangle, could you put them in the middle of the triangle and they could go to three plants? I think, you know, based on the inherent safety, I think those are things that the NRC is going to have to look at as they watch the advanced reactors and they look at the oversight program and look at the inherent safety. Um, you know, I know with my design, my, sa my safety system is always on. It doesn't have to initiate. So, you know, um, you know well, that, change, that changes the risk dynamics that the NRC has to look at. So I, I think they still serve their purpose. The NRC will have to evaluate long term what they think will be the right coverage just like I think what Scott said with the industry at the table to try to give their perspectives. Um, and so that's where I think it's going. Thanks, George. Yeah, you know, I, I think about this question quite a bit, given my position. And, you know, when it comes to the advanced reactor construction oversight and the advanced reactor oversight process, I keep coming back to the same basic concept, which is all the different facets and things we need to consider about inspection footprint, emergency response. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it all, you know, we, it kind of spreads out and it gets multifaceted and it all converges back in and, and funnels back into the same basic concept, which is risk. And so, I, you know, I, I think it's fair to say no matter what, uh, you know, as we, as we come through the thought process and decision making and going into the future in this, I could, I, I'm pretty certain whatever decision we come to is going to be risk informed. <laughs> and, and, and Jack, I know you know this, but risk has many dimensions. There's, exactly. There's technical risk. Um, from some sort of reactor uh, issue to there's legal risk. There's uh, yeah, there's not just there's, there's 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 credibility. You know, public credibility risk. There's so there's there's many dimensions to it that need will have to be factored in. Yes, I th and I, I can't wait to get to those questions in the future. Thank you. I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> um, that wasn't positive. I thought it was very positive. Okay. I don't know, Zach. Did you want me to <laughs> give some? Did you want me to give some <laughs> highlights of what the industry sees? I know that there was a question you were going to ask me about what the industry sees in a resident. Oh, um, yeah. I guess that's fair. I, I kind of all current residents cover your ears for a second. <laughs> 
One of the things I noticed when I was trying to find an industry representative for the panel is there was no shortage of former resident inspectors and current, that are serving in leadership positions in industry. <laughs> We have, we have CNOs, we have site VPs, there's, there's reg affairs directors, there's lots of different individuals at, at many different uh, positions across the industry that, that, that were former, our former resident inspectors. So George, yeah, if you want to provide some, uh, some thoughts and some input on what you think, uh, you know, causes that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, um, I find the resident inspector's background um, to be very enticing. You know, they have a very broad general knowledge of the plant, all the programs, how the programs fit together, how the licensing basis is developed. They're a self-starter. I know that they, I can, they know how to prioritize things from one to N. They know how to do verbal and written communications um, very well. Um, they understand how to troubleshoot. They understand how the regulations fit into the licensing basis. So, you know, that is, you know, that is something that the NRC teaches them and is very, you know, potentially very attractive. They can fill a lot of roles and, and, and you know, at a site or in a company. Thanks, George. That's good. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, I think, you know, yeah, the, 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 that sort of concept that the residents are just a jack of all trades and many of them are masters of several, <laughs> uh, really makes them just this multifaceted individual capable of so much. One of the things I, it's not a fair comparison, coming from a Navy background, I try to stay away from Navy uh, metaphors, but you know, in the, in, in, in the, in the Navy, the, you know, the, the sort of the pinnacle career moment is when you're the captain of the ship and, the, and then this just below that is the executive officer. And once you've checked that box, then, then you know, you're, you're basically set to do whatever you want in the Navy in your future career, as long as you do a good job. Um, while resident inspector, I would never try to compare the job of resident inspector to the captain of a ship. Um, I do think that job, that resident inspector position serves a similar role within the NRC. Once you've, once you've been a resident inspector and a senior resident inspector, you've, you've checked a certain box and you, you've proven yourself capable of, of that level of responsibility and capability, I think. So on that note, I want to I want to wrap up with one last question, for, formal question before we uh, we have a couple minutes for some questions from the uh, audience. Um, I've shown a lot of photos of residents in the field today. Uh, most of them, they were smiling, uh, <laughs> if they weren't focused on equipment. Um, and obviously, here's a photo of our, our residents in Region Three, recent or Region Two, recently, uh, all smiling. Uh, that's. That's because I believe, and I think all the folks on this panel believe, and we've talked about this some already, that this is the best job in the NRC. Um, it's, there, there's some difficulties with staffing, concerns about moving, cost of living. Uh, it's a hard job, it, you know, the actual job is hard, but I think it's very rewarding. Um, and, when, and when I talk to residents, when I survey them, and ask them what are their concerns are, what are the things we need to address, it's never, make the job easier. They understand the job they're getting into. They like the job. They, they feel rewarded by this job. It's really all those other things. And so with that in mind, uh, could you all describe the good things about being a resident inspector, what you did, what, what you liked about being a resident inspector, why it's such a great job? Um, I'll, whoever wants to go first. I'll go first. <laughs> It'll be refreshing to say nice things. <laughs> The best part of the resident job is to contribute to the safe and reliable operation of the nuclear power plant that I'm stationed for the benefit of the public. My job changes every day. There are a variety of plant activities that I can inspect that keeps the job interesting and it keeps me very engaged. For example, I can review the material condition of the plant and its components. I can observe equipment testing. I can observe training or I can follow up on an equipment failure that allows me to learn the details of system design, maintenance, and operation. As an example, on a Monday, I may perform a fire walk down and identify too much fire loading near some safety-related pumps. I can also observe on Tuesday that this material has been removed as the result of my observation. On a Wednesday, I may observe a leak on an air valve for an emergency diesel generator. I can also observe the maintenance the following week to replace the valve due to my observation. On a Thursday, I can review breaker failures 
and identify that the industry recommends that a component be replaced every six years, yet the station is replacing the components every 18 years. I can then observe the maintenance activities over the next year to, place, to replace these components at their next available opportunity. On Friday, of course, I must document this information for my upcoming inspection report. These are some simple examples that I identified or was involved in. These examples also highlight the diversity of the job and a small snapshot of my personal contributions to the safe and reliable operation of the power plants where I was stationed. Personal satisfaction for me is leaving something better than I found it. The resident inspector job provides me many opportunities to accomplish this. To summarize, the best part of the resident job is reviewing a variety of activities and contributing to the safe and reliable operation of the plant. And when you meet someone and they ask you what you do, it's pretty cool to tell them that, you know, you inspect nuclear power plants. I don't know who's next. Pretty tough to top that. <laughs> I, I mean, for I me, I, just, I love the access. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, just a curious person in general, and I like, as an engineer, I like to see how things work. Um, I, I just like the freedom of, you know, being within the bounds, the confines of the program to be curious and follow things and be able to, I think I mentioned it earlier, access to whether it's a mechanic, an operator, the site VP, the member of the public, whatever it is. I mean, that just the diversity was, was what I really found appealing. So. I was just going to say this, the continuing, uh, the continuous learning opportunities that uh, being a resident inspector afforded me. Um, and, you know, I, you know, being, in re being a resident inspector for some 13 years, I actually saw my, the, my impact on sites. I, I thought I added a, a lot of value um, to safe, um, the licensees program in terms of safety and safety focus. And so that was the most, um, that was the thing that gave me satisfaction of being a resident inspector. <coughs> Again, just the opportunities for situational leadership um, is just was invaluable. So thank you. That's it. Thanks, Billy. George, anything? Or you don't have to. Well, I, I, uh, I enjoyed making the plant overall safer. Yeah. I think we had the same objective. I mean, it was my, my goal to make sure that my plant, that when I was the resident and the senior, that it stayed a good operating plant. I also knew that if it was a bad operating plant, my life became miserable with all the extra hours. So it was beneficial for me to keep it at a strong operating plant. But I added value, and I could see where I added value, and I took pride in that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you nailed it all. I, you know, for me, I mean, there's no right answer. <laughs> uh, for me, Scott, you know, I, you know, part of what you said, we, you know, it was nice to know that, um, you know, within the baseline inspection program, I had my quarterly inspection reports. I had my my sample numbers I needed to hit, um, and so I had some. I, I had a known product I had to, uh, you know, div, you know, provide. Uh, that, that was nice knowing that I had that behind me. As long as I did that, I was in good shape. But then having the freedom within that to take that baseline inspection program and, and adapt it to the things that I was seeing at my site and you know, getting out in the field and actually uh, doing those inspections and, and having that, that ability to see the different facets and all the different aspects. It was, you know, I, I don't know about you all, about one or two in the afternoon, I start to get a little, if I'm sitting at my computer, and knowing that I could just grab my hard hat and you know head out and, and get some plant status done, maybe follow up on a sample I was working on, go talk to someone, uh, it, it just meant so much to me. It was such a, you know, a, a refreshing part of the job, and it's, it, was, it's, it's really made me happy to be there. All right. Um, that's it for the formal portion. Uh, but we do have some questions from the audience. First one's for you, Scott. Uh, this one is from Faraz Ahosini. Greetings, I would like to ask, what approach do you recommend who embarking nuclear countries when it comes to the resident inspectors? I guess basically setting up a resident inspector program? Uh, wow, interesting. Um, so I think, um, there's a lot of things come to mind, but one thing is um, don't, tr don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, <laughs> take advantage of, uh, so there's obviously many countries that have operating nuclear facilities have, that are either in construction or have been operating or even at the back end decommissioning. 
So, uh, and, I, and I have witnessed in my international interactions um, a, a lot of desire to collaborate and share information. So by all means, you know, reach out to your international liaison folks and, and you know, engage me or any, any country that has this program. Um, don't, so don't reinvent the wheel is what I would say. No, and I would say reach out to countries that don't have it. I mean, I, I think Spain does have resident inspectors. I think, I think France does not. But when you think about, you know, France has a lot of reactors, but it's a pretty small country, and so they can get to any, any of those mm -hmm. facilities pretty quickly, and it's not too burdensome on, the, on those inspectors to get out and do those yeah. inspections. Yeah, I would also say, I mentioned it in passing, but um, before you can operate a plant, you've got to build one, right? And so, <laughs> so we also have uh, construction residents. Mm -hmm. So th there's a really, I think, important opportunity during the construction phase of a facility to have resident inspectors and region-based inspectors who do specialty uh, uh, work. Um, and that, that, that's where it starts. That's where you start to build that, that, uh, that, that infrastructure that you'll need for the operating phase. Sorry, I was going through the other questions. Yes. <laughs> um, that was good. Um, Let's see here. Our, this one is uh, for uh, any of us, really. Uh, are there opportunities for HQ staff to support the resident inspector offices to mitigate some of the staffing issues that Jen described? Yes. Uh, for any of the HQ staff, staff that may be listening, we have an inspection opportunities portal. And if you are not and would like to get uh, inspector qualified, you can talk to anyone in the division reactor oversight in my, in my division office in NRR, and we'll set you up with a qual card and be happy to give you checkouts and, send, and get you out to sites and get you some experience, and you can contribute to those inspections. Um, we do get some uh, headquarters folks out on inspections. I've been on inspections with headquarters staff. I am a headquarters staff member, and I'm still inspector qualified, and I do go out on inspections a couple times a year. Um, most of the folks in Division Reactor Oversight do do that as well, so that is something that's available to everyone. And if you're a headquarters staff and the 15% annual retention bonus sounds like a really good deal, you can become a resident inspector as well. You do not have to be a member of the Resident Inspector Development Program in order to do that. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have. We, we do have one more thing to do. Uh, it is the 50th anniversary. It take, you know, the actual uh, date is in late June. Um, but we're going to kick off a, uh, a social media campaign where we have current resident inspectors uh, provide posts that talk about what they think of the program and why the program is so valuable to them. Uh, and to kick off the social media campaign, we've developed a video, uh, and we'd like to air, you know, uh, preview the video now. This is going to be its, its official release here. You're all seeing it for the very first time. It's, uh, it's premiere night. Uh, so if we could go ahead and kick, uh, uh, provide the video. Yep. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the start of the Resident Inspector Program in June. And over the next few months, we'll be acknowledging and highlighting resident inspectors' contributions to our mission and hear in their own words what it means to do this critical job. We meet our important safety and security mission in many ways, but one of the most important is through our resident inspectors. They're stationed at every U.S. nuclear power plant to watch the daily operations at the sites and serve as our eyes and ears on the ground. The program first started in 1974 as a trial run with one inspector at the Kiwani and Point Beach nuclear power plants. In 1977, we expanded the program with more inspectors at more plants after concluding that the concept worked. In all, some 1,150 resident inspectors have served at the NRC since the start of the program. Now, 50 years later, there are 119 NRC resident inspectors at 94 operating nuclear reactors and two fuel cycle facilities. 
The NRC puts all resident inspectors through a rigorous 18 to 24 month qualification program. The new inspectors learn about federal safety regulations and their role in independently verifying these requirements are being met at U.S. operating commercial reactors. Towards the end of the process, there's a final qualification board during which senior inspectors and managers evaluate how well the individual integrates and applies inspector competencies into field situations. Resident inspectors come from a variety of backgrounds, but most have degrees in engineering or science. Some served in the Navy's nuclear program, others worked in the nuclear industry, and others were recruited directly from college. Once the resident inspectors complete their training, they're assigned to a plant. There, they spend their days keeping an eye on plant activities to ensure the plants are meeting NRC safety criteria. No day is ever the same. Inspectors, for example, may visit control rooms and review operator logbook entries, observe operators performing plant manipulations, visually assess areas of the plant, observe test of or repairs to important systems or components, interact with plant employees to determine if they have any safety concerns, and review corrective action documents to ensure problems have been identified and fixes implemented. If resident inspectors uncover safety critical issues, they immediately notify plan operators who must remedy them. And then the resident inspector relays the information to NRC management. If issues are serious enough, the NRC will consider taking enforcement action. Resident inspectors are the agency's eyes and ears and boots on the ground for what's happening in and around the plant. Resident inspectors live in the community near the plants. However, to maintain objectivity, they're restricted from interacting socially with plant employees. In addition, resident inspectors can only stay at one plant for a maximum of seven years. Many of our senior officials got their start as resident inspectors. Join us in commemorating the Resident Inspector Program's 50th anniversary, and check back with us over the coming months to hear more about what it means to carry out this vital work. According to my clock, I have 17 seconds left, so I did it just about right.